Welcome to the Thames Luminaries Lecture Series, truly collaborative effort to celebrate our amazing local luminaries and their landscapes drawn to the area by the Thames. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'll be the host for these lectures. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to our chair for this evening. She's a lecturer herself, a literary historian and a luminary. It's Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you, Rachel, for your introduction and for um, organising this, this whole series, which is, is now in its, its second series and the third week of the second series. And it's been uh, extraordinary to be able to connect with so many people in lockdown. There are over 700 people here tonight, and I know many of you are coming back for repeat uh, visits. So it's, it's, it's great to have you and to be building this uh, set of, of, of audiences and, and so you can see all the interconnections between our different gardens in the Thames Basin area. I'm really delighted to introduce the, this project of the restoration of, of Boston Manor Park, but also to introduce our two speakers. You know, so we have two for the price of one tonight, and they're both fantastic speakers with um, really interesting different takes on this one project. David Stockdale is Head of Culture at the London Borough of Hounslow and has been working on the lottery funded restoration of Boston Manor House and Park since 2015. He's previously worked at medieval castles and in historic houses ranging from the 17th to the 19th century and is a research associate at the University of York. Our other speaker, um, Sion Tyson, who leads the design team in the regeneration of Boston Manor Park, is a landscape architect with a particular interest in public parks. He has recently completed the restoration of Kersney Abbey for Dover District Council as the part of the Heritage Lottery Parks for People programme. Over to you, David. Thanks, Judith, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining, joining us tonight for this talk about Boston Manor Park. Um, some of you may know uh, Boston Manor Park, uh, which is in Brentford. It's a 10 minute walk from Boston Manor Tube Station um, and actually is right next to Boston uh, Manor Road uh, and the new cycle superhighway. Um, it's perhaps no surprise um, that before it was a public park, it was actually a private estate. Uh, this is a postcard from 1913 showing the rather splendid uh, estate gates. Uh, and you can just get a glimpse uh, through those gates of hedgerows uh, along the uh, uh, Boston Manor Road, uh, which divided part of the estate. Uh, there have been some quite famous and notable people who've either owned the estate or lived there, um, including seven generations of the Clitheroe family, who were descended from merchants and a former mayor of London. Um, and also briefly the American John Quincy Adams diplomat who later became the sixth president uh, of the United States. Less well known is that before it was uh, a private estate, uh, Boston Manor was actually owned by a religious house. And it was owned by uh, a priory uh, in Bishopsgate. Uh, and they owned it right up to the Reformation uh, until at which point uh, the lands were taken off them uh, as part of the uh, dissolution land grab uh, in the early 16th century. At that point, uh, the land became the property of the Crown, who then used it to uh, send and give to their favourites. Um, so the first recipient was Edward Seymour, uh, Lord Protector, Duke of Somerset, and he was given it by Edward VI um, until uh, he fired favour, his lands were confiscated, uh, and so was Boston Manor. It went back to the Crown and stayed uh, with the Crown until the reign of Elizabeth I. She gave it to her favourite, Robert Dudley, uh, and he promptly uh, looked at the gift and sold it to the Tudor, Tudor financier, Sir Thomas Gresham. Um, at that point, it never went back to the Crown uh, and stayed in private hands uh, for the rest of its history until the 1920s. By a strange twist of Eight, the uh, original owners, St Helen's Priory, had uh, mutated and transformed themselves into a very important parish church. In fact, one of the most important parish churches uh, in the city of London. And it was, ironically, Thomas Gresham's own local church. He therefore put in his, in his will that he wished to be buried there when he died. Uh, and this was uh, subsequently came to pass. This is his rather 
uh, a splendid tomb. Uh, and so even though St. El St. Helens uh, didn't get their lands back, they did get the honour uh, of having the usurper's bones uh, in their church. This is a, an 18th century map uh, centering on uh, Boston Manor and the house at the middle of the estate. So it shows part of the estate. Uh, and what this map shows quite interestingly is some of the topography of the land uh, around the area. So in the middle there you have the River Brent uh, and the valley bottom. Uh, and you then have these very steep uh, contours showing and then you have level higher land. And this is interesting because um, it's been thought that uh, a typical medieval estate of this type had to have a balance uh, of types of land in order to get maximum economic productive use. So they obviously had the river for fishing rights, they had water meadows uh, next to the, uh, the river, and then the higher land was more cultivable uh, and could be used for, for ordinary crops. Interestingly, at Boston Manor, they also had uh, up in the corner here by the house, um, uh, an area which uh, was used for fish ponds. There's a natural spring which rises near the house and then goes uh, underground and flows back to the River Brent. Um, and we think that in medieval times this was dammed uh, and, and used uh, as fish ponds uh, rather than uh, just as a spring, uh, as a supply of water. We don't have any uh, early enough maps really to show this, but there is this early 17th century map of the other side of the River Brent uh, which clearly shows uh, a string of fish ponds uh, along a stream which flows into the river. And this was the other side of the river from Boston Manor, uh, and it was a stretch of land which was part of the Osterley House, uh, uh, Osterley Estate. Uh, so this is a, a survey drawing um, of uh, the estate. It's part of the uh, later records um, of Boston Manor. The, um, uh, estate records before the late 17th, 17th century didn't survive because there was a, a fire in the 1650s. Um, but we do uh, have a, a good series of records uh, from the late 17th century. And so the fish ponds are mentioned for the first time, and here they are uh, next to the house, which is in red. Uh, the fish ponds are mentioned for the first time in 1690s. Uh, and then again, in more detail, in an account that the then owner Christopher Clithero gave of his holdings when he mentions a stew pond and five fish ponds well stocked and paled in. Now paled in means fenced uh, for protection. Uh, and a stew pond, by the way, uh, is a larder pond uh, where the fish that are ready to eat are kept just before they're brought to the table. So this is um, a 1782 drawing uh, uh, in the, uh, the right here. Um, and this was uh, at this date, they were actually thinking of combining um, the fish ponds uh, into uh, one ornamental lake. And you can probably just make out uh, the pencil lines here, which show some of the ideas for how they were going to combine the fish ponds. We're not quite sure exactly when they did that, but at the end of the 18th century, this had been achieved. Um, and uh, they then uh, uh, achieved this ornamental lake you see in, in this plan here, the shape of it, again, next to the house, um, and a photograph here from the early 20th century of the view from that lake uh, uh, back to the house. Um, and by this, they, the, the lake itself was part of a, an overhaul of the estate, which produced a whole load of sort of more naturalistic planting. Um, this meant that um, some of the more sort of formal parts of the estate and really the more working parts of the estate had all been swept away. So you can see here in this survey drawing that in fact the estate originally included lots of outhouses and buildings and functional buildings right next to the house itself, uh, which is this uh, building here, um, but also three yards, a uh, watering pond, which we think was this one or this one, uh, but a watering pond for cattle, again, right next to the, the main house, which was shared with the uh, tenant of Boston Manor Farm, um, uh, an orchard and a garden in front of the house that had its own wall and, own, uh, and very much formal planting, as you can see uh, from the beds here. Um, in addition, uh, and this probably comes out clearer on uh, the, the mid 18th century map by John Roke, 
Uh, you can see again the formal uh, walled off garden. You can see the fish ponds, uh, which Roque found quite hard to uh, delineate, uh, but also groves of trees here, uh, which lead down and a central walk right down uh, to the river, uh, to the River Brent. So a very sort of mix of uh, formal landscaping and working agricultural buildings. This was all swept away. It was uh, improved in the late 18th century. Uh, and not only was the lake um, um, formed out of those fish ponds, but the former uh, walled garden that, that you can see, or the garden with a wall that you can see by the house, is replaced by naturalistic lawn uh, with trees. Uh, and even these groves of trees um, then are, are prettified a little bit and they have uh, sinuous walks added, which take you gradually uh, down to the river. And it's this structure which re really sort of uh, lays the, the bones uh, of the modern park uh, that you can see today. Uh, this is uh, James Clitheroe and his wife Anne. James was the grandson of Christopher Clitheroe, who uh, wrote extensively about the estate. And in this portrait, which was painted in the 1750s, you can see some of the early 18th century uh, features still surviving. So these are the groves of trees um, and the central uh, wide, wide walk that takes you up to a vista uh, of Boston Manor House behind. Um, by the way, this painting, which was by Arthur Devis, um, is not known uh, where it is to, uh, today. It was sold in 1922, so we only have this black and white uh, sales catalogue photograph of it. If anybody does know where it is, we'd be absolutely delighted uh, to hear. James was also responsible um, for planting the great cedars, which are one of the, the landmarks um, at Boston Manor. Uh, and in fact, this tree here uh, has uh, the largest girth of any uh, great cedar uh, in, in London. Um, and in his account book, um, he actually mentions and writes um, on the 31st of May, 1754, I sowed the seeds that produced the cedars I now have. And in 1782, I cut down two of them and sawed them into boards. Uh, so those estate books are, are quite a, uh, an interesting eye uh, uh, for his, his time and development on the estate. He ran the estate for over 50 years. And one of the major developments that took place in his time was the coming of the Grand Union Canal. Uh, this uh, canal was conceived to shorten the uh, transit time from the Midlands to London. Previously, the canal network had stretched down to Oxford uh, and then had followed down uh, and via the Thames to London. Now it was conceived that it could cut straight through uh, to London from the Midlands and land at Brentford. Uh, this meant actually taking over large stretches of the River Brent, which are shown in the plan on the left. Um, and the sections coloured pink uh, are the line of the canal um, and the sections left in blue um, are those parts of the river that were too bendy to adopt. So anything in heavy pink uh, is, is river turned into canal. You can see a stretch of uh, new pink canal cut through here um, and um, the, um, this left a, a section of river and created a new island, Clitheroe's Island which had previously been formed out of part of the, the south bank uh, of the estate. Uh, canals were very much the motorways of their day. They were crucial infrastructure, uh, providing travel and tra transit and trade uh, for the country. Um, and they were, um, like infrastructure, they were essentially decided nationally in parliament and landowners were then compensated for any alterations to their land. Uh, this was very much echoed 150 years later uh, when Boston Manor, because of its position in outer West London, became the candidate for a new motorway. Um, this started as the London South West Wales uh, motorway, um, and the first section of it was the Chiswick flyover, uh, which was opened uh, in 1959, and the opening ceremony was graced by the Hollywood star uh, Jane, Jane Mansfield. Um, the uh, few years later, in the early 60s, this flyover section was extended uh, over and through Boston Manor Park, and this became the first few junctions of the M4 completed in 1964. 
The park is about to go into a new period of transformation. Uh, London Borough of Hounslow is very grateful to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, who have awarded us £3.635 million pounds to undertake a capital Parks for People project. And we're just at the very beginning of this project, which is uh, due to really uh, start with the spade in the ground uh, next April. But I'm going to hand you over uh, to our landscape architect, Sion Tyson, invite him to turn his camera on, which he has done, um, and hand over to him for the next part of the talk. Sion, over to you. Yes, thanks very much, um, David. Um, I've been involved in the project probably for the last three or four years, something um, like that. And as David has said, uh, we're now getting to the construction phase. That should be finished by the autumn of 22. So if you're um, interested in the project and um, uh, fancy a visit, then that would probably be a good time to come and visit. Um, tonight, I'm gonna to be talking about the project challenges. Um, but um, I'm going to approach this slightly unconventionally and um, talk about the, the background first and um, uh, the process really. Um, the process really can be thought of as um, uh, comprised of, of three phases really. So this, the seeing phase, the shaping phase and the building phase. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about the, the seeing and shaping phases this evening. Yeah, so this, the seeing phase is um, <clears throat> uh, all about analysis and um, you know developing a deep appreciation of the site. The following slides that I'm going to go through um, uh, give a kind of a sense of the work that we do that isn't desktop based. It isn't um, you know the research and the history. It's more our own kind of um, experiences and observations on site and and and, and learning from you know, others who use the park. Um, some quick examples here, you know, we, we see paddleboardists and canoeists come up the river, um, exploring the site, which we'd like to encourage more. Um, you know, there is a kind of strategically important piece of infrastructure that runs through the park that has security requirements and maintenance that we need to think about. Uh, we discovered a derelict boiler um, that used to heat the glass houses um, and, recalls, if you like, um, a time when the estate grew its own food. So that's very interesting. Uh, next slide, please, David. So these um, are further examples of that, really, um, these um, um, things that we've observed on site. This slide, too, um, is really um, about going to site when we know there are um, events on. The um, M4 itself, really evokes quite a strong atmosphere. It's quite a um, surreal and eerie um, place in many ways and um, lends itself, I think, to running annual festivals like the Junction 2, it's an ele electronic music festival, and also as the location for films. So um, the BBC drama Killing Eve was um, filmed here. Um, but there's also downsides of that, if you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, um, it really um, has an impact on the park's infrastructure, um, all of this. Um, this slide um, I included just because I wanted to give you a quick um, overview of the technical side of the work we do, which is also um, challenging. Um, I, I won't go into great detail, but we look at trees in terms of species and timelines, uh, look at pollution, particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide levels to make sure the site is safe and and how that might change over time. Uh, we look at demographics, um, the sociological context um, in terms of the local community and, and social deprivation, and then more the strategic context as well um, in terms of um, you know, the, the planning designations, uh, flood zones, um, and how people are moving through the site where the tube stations are, the big businesses in the area. So two, um, slides that, um, or two examples that I did want to go into a bit more detail um, about this evening are the Conservation Management Plan, or CMP for short, and also our own um, analysis. Um, uh, I became very interested during that process because the Conservation Management Plan is really the starting point for a lot of our work, uh, places um, the um, state in some kind of context in terms of the natural built and, and 
cultural heritage of the park. So I became very interested in looking at um, kind of commonalities and influences and design evolution of the park um, in the context of local estates, so particularly Simon Park and um, Chiswick. Um, so Chiswick was um, designed by uh, Charles Bridgman and um, William Kent, and, and Kent um, particularly was famous for uh, leaping the fence and seeing all nature as a garden. And this really um, was a, a real shift from the way things were done previously, the re rejection of the kind of formal style. And he was bringing nature right up to the house, um, borrowing views and um, using classical devices to create this episodic experience of the landscape. He was also very interested in um, uh, respecting the um, character um, of the landscape, which Alexander Pope um, called um, consulting the genius loci of a place. Um, and um, subsequent slides that I'll share with you um, uh, show some of these direct influences um, in the park. Scion Park, um, on the other hand, um, was um, enlarged and remodeled by Capability Brown. Um, this is much more about the, the kind of big landscape components, uh, the parkland and uh, woodland belts and contoured ground and um, uh, these kind of carefully contrived views and uh, where the building sits in the context of the park. So, um, so um, as I said, I became quite interested in this process and, and David's already led us through um, some regression mapping, um, but we did this um, by um, kind of interpolating various historical plans. I've got four examples here, but they're very interesting because um, the earliest one from kind of 1741 um, you know, show some um, direct parallels to Chiswick. Um, we've only got the river at that point, we don't have the canal, and we've got this um, axial route um, from the house, from the lawn, directly down to the river, um, but a big separation between the kind of historic core and then the, the landscape of production. Um, uh, the 1800s, um, we see uh, much more of an affinity with Scion Park. So this is really Boston Manor Park evolving to become um, its kind of most naturalistic. The lake um, is organically shaped. We've got these flowing paths and they're really making use of the entire park, um, connecting it to the river and canal and these pleasure walks. There's still a landscape of production, but it's um, uh, much more akin to the English landscape movement that we're familiar with and Capability Brown's work. Um, and then these were just included to show how in 1865, um, unfortunately, um, you know, the landscape reverted to more rectilinear geometries. We see kind of greater um, separation between the lawns and the woodland. It's not as integrated um, and a, a greater emphasis really on um, plant collecting, growing food, um, um, and as I said, um, you know, we've lost um, uh, some of those flowing paths and that naturalistic style that um, we had uh, 60 years previous to, to, to this incarnation. Um, I also included a present day one, which really um, shows the biggest changes the landscape went through uh, in the 1920s when the, um, the estate was adapted to become a public park and all the facilities um, that um, you know, were um, uh, you know, built at the time. And then also in the 1960s, um, the motorway and then the tree belts and how it's become overgrown um, since then. So all of this is really important um, because it provides a context really for understanding um, you know, what we should or what we could potentially reclaim, what's practical to do so and, and what's appropriate. Um, the last piece of the puzzle, um, as far as um, the seeing phase is concerned today, is our own analysis, and that's very much a kind of um, confirmation of some of the points I've made. So the park became very um, insular, lost its connection with the river. Um, it never really um, meshed very well the, the landscape of production with the historic core. Um, uh, 
it's very compartmentalized today, um, partly to do with the um, both the physical and the kind of psychological barrier that the M4 presents, but it's also to do with the fact that a lot of the kind of character areas are very overgrown. Um, I would just say though that um, it's not kind of all bad news. There are um, quite interesting things as well in the park. Um, I think these um, kind of modern intrusions um, have an interesting way of um, kind of colliding and interacting with some of the more historical ones. And there are amazing assets in the park, um, the walled garden, the house, and the lake that can be um, uh, you know, brought back to life. And um, I think the word reconnection became very important in formulating a vision, has been the kind of the driving word behind a lot of the proposals. So that's it on the um, on the, um, the kind of seeing phase, and now it's really moving into the into the shaping into the shaping phase. Um, that can be divided into everyday challenges and legacy challenges. So they all really stem from the fact that the park is um, quite underused and has quite a low profile. Uh, that's essentially to do with the fact that um, there aren't many facilities and toilets and refreshments. There aren't many events on. We have access problems in the park, safety issues, and um, that type of thing that are pretty typical of many public parks. Um, these um, uh, photos um, that I've included with then precedent images just show a kind of um, before and after, if you like, and there are ways of um, methodically working through these issues. And that's why I didn't start on this um, because um, uh, it's not as interesting, I guess, as some of the philosophical points that um, David and I have been discussing and that um, you can probably pick up on the questions and answers later. What I would though say is that that's a cafe currently. Um, the way of making a park more um, vibrant and um, uh, uh, enjoyable is, you know, um, by creating a cafe, creating a community space, giving people somewhere to go. Similarly, the service yard is derelict currently, um, but can be converted so that volunteers can use it as a base we can um, create a gardening group in the future and bring more activity in the park. It's just one example of activity. M4 flyover at the moment um, is engulfed by trees. Um, we're starting a program of clearance works at the moment, but that will improve surveillance and sight lines into that area. There's lots of things that we can do to celebrate that structure and make it somewhere that people want to go. Similarly, um, we're creating a new access from the canal bridge to the historic core, which will um, totally and utterly change the park circulation um, uh, in the future. Um, and just quickly touching on this, so this is to do with the park's profile. Um, the image at the top left is kind of the park now, the piers have been replaced, but it's really just about making something um, that's welcoming, that, that, that shouts that it's a public park and that we want people to visit it. So again, and things that we can quite methodically work through and that we are doing um, uh, to bring in new audiences um, into the park. And then this is um, the last couple of slides really on this. So um, legacy issues are slightly different. Um, they are uh, potentially more difficult to um, address in that you know, they lie in the decisions of the past. Um, the house um, originally was the um, epicenter of the park, and it's questionary about how to reinvigorate that whilst kind of acknowledging that people arrive at different points, that there are, there's a different focus on the amenity area and the cafe, and how to try and resolve that um, now when the landscape has moved on. Um, this slide was just included just to show the nature of the um, compartmentalized landscape um, and the character areas that we have. So it's really about um, keeping those intact, but um, uh, making the park far more um, open and cohesive and how to achieve that. Again, I touched on the tree clearance works, but a lot of this um, is to do with reconnection. So reconnection with the community, reconnection with the canal, and the, and, and the river. 
um, through clearance work and through better linkages in the future. Thank you, Sian. Thank you very much. Um, and um, this this is one which uh, uh, leads into what we're calling the end of the talk and the new nature. Really, we there are things that um, historically we can uh, restore and things that we can't, such as the uh, the central walk uh, uh, behind uh, the Clitheroes. Um, can't uh, no, will now terminate by the motorway, as you can see uh, in in this upper. Uh, in this upper section. So instead, we're looking at producing a, a woodland walk instead uh, to replace uh, the feeling of coming down to the river. The um, project will also basically not only pay for improvement in the park, um, but also for activity. Uh, there will be uh, opportunities for volunteer work, including clearing uh, of material in the river. And uh, the ecology will be improved by opening up uh, sections of the park and restoring river views, but also uh, actually allowing people to engage with the waterway um, and different parts of, of the habitats uh, in the park. Um, I think an overall feature of, of the ecology of the park to now um, is that um, a lot of it is overgrown. Uh, and although it looks healthy, um, an ecology report has shown that uh, in areas where it is overgrown, there are um, there's, there's nothing uh, underneath the tree canopy, there's no undergrowth apart from a bit of ivy. Um, there are areas which are just full of uh, effectively seedlings which have grown up um, and even some of the really important veteran trees are just swamped by a uh, low growing shrub. So what we want to do is, is open all that up and in fact the ecology will actually improve by having more diversity and obviously there's a lot of opportunities for volunteers to get involved with coppicing, uh, planting, um, uh, and helping us to maintain those spaces. Sian already mentioned uh, the service yard, which is here, which is another area where we're looking to have volunteer uh, horticulture, uh, and the walled garden, or at least part of what was the kitchen garden um, uh, for the estate, uh, will be improved and replanted um, and made again into a space where, where uh, we can grow uh, we can grow things in, in beds. Um, and the cafe, this is the existing footprint of the cafe shown here in white, will be extended to a much bigger building shown in yellow. Um, and so we'll have a community cafe and a new activity hub, which will be the, the base for uh, activities in the park, including learning programs such as forest schools, uh, nature walks, other activities and events. Um, and new staff will be based in this in this hub uh, building. We will have a natural park manager and a learning and volunteer coordinator, all funded by the lottery to help re-energize uh, the improved park. And finally, the um, this park uh, project actually sits alongside another lottery funded project uh, at Boston Manor House itself, where, which has already started, where we're, we're aiming to restore uh, and reopen large parts of the house. So we have these two uh, tandem projects. Um, the house is scheduled to open sometime next year in 2022, and the park will be done in phases. We're hoping to keep large parts of the park open uh, as the capital works proceed. Uh, but sometime probably in 2023, uh, we will have all of the park open again. So there's lots of opportunities for people to come and see what we're about to do. Um, if you're interested in supporting our work, with these projects or just to find out more information i can leave these two email addresses up uh, on screen uh, and you can just get in touch with us uh, there uh, thanks very much